Good evening and welcome to this Berea College Convocation. Today's service convocation is co-sponsored by KELTS, the Center for Excellence in Learning Through Service. I'm Katie McElrath, a 2017 Berea College graduate, a former Bonner Scholar and Program Manager of Berea Buddies. After graduating from Berea, I moved to Philadelphia to attend the University of Pennsylvania to earn my Master of Social Work degree in 2019. I stayed at UPenn and took a position as Data and Food Coordinator for Agatston Urban Nutrition Initiative, a SNAP-Ed program within the Netter Center for Community Partnerships. AUNI provides direct nutrition education and runs a community shared agriculture program for low-income residents of West Philadelphia. I'll be your moderator for this evening, so please use the Q&A function to submit any questions you may have for our speaker. To introduce today's convocation speaker, I welcome Elvia Rojas, who is a Berea College senior and Bonner Scholar, who's majoring in political science and Spanish. Elvia also holds a labor position in Celts as the program manager of the Hispanic Outreach Program. Welcome, Elvia. We're pleased to welcome Tamara Sandberg as today's convocation speaker, as she shares with us about food insecurity in the US, exploring causes and solutions. Tamara Sandberg currently serves as Save the Children's US Food Security and Nutrition Advisor, a new position that was created in the past year in direct response to the sharp increase in children struggling with hunger in rural communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Ms. Sandberg is particularly familiar with innovative responses to hunger in Kentucky, as she previously served as the director of Feeding Kentucky, formerly the Kentucky Association of Food Banks. Tamara Sandberg may be a, fam may be a familiar name to many of you, as she was a member of the Berea community for well over a decade. Ms. Sandberg traces her passion for anti-hunger advocacy back to her experiences as a volunteer when she was in high school. Her story may resonate with many Berea College students and graduates who became involved as volunteers and advocates for issues that they care about and then make a path to incorporating that work into their vocations and careers. Ms. Sandberg, welcome. We look forward to hearing from you this evening. Thank you so much, Elvia. It's an honor to be here. Um, as Elvia mentioned, I'm very familiar with Berea College and I really have enjoyed the time, um, just have such happy memories of the time that we spent at Berea. Uh, we have lots of happy memories of riding our bikes across campus with our kids and participating in the chili cook-offs uh, down at Brushy Fork, which my husband won a few times, I'm proud to say. Um, we were at Berea because uh, my husband, Curtis, was the former director of academic services. And that's, that's what brought us to Kentucky. So just have such happy memories of Berea and such an honor to be uh, invited back. Many of our kids, friends, are friends with current students, such as Elvia. It was so nice to see her tonight. Uh, if I can, uh, I'd like to make a special shout out to Wade Bradford, who's one of my son's best friends from high school. And Wade, I just want to say I'm so sorry I could not hand deliver Raising Cane's chicken to you tonight. Uh, if we had been in person, I would have brought some with me, but I'm really sorry about that. Um, honestly, I'd much rather have been speaking inside of that beautiful Phelps Stroke Chapel, but we're making the best of it and we are going to get through this pandemic. So. Uh, thank you for your willingness to endure yet more time on Zoom today. So as Alvia mentioned, I am the advisor for food security and nutrition for Save the Children. And I will say from the outset, I am a practitioner. I'm not a researcher. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this being a learning opportunity for everybody, including me. I'm looking forward to the Q&A, looking forward to hearing from Katie as we uh, kind of tag team on the Q&A section. I have to say, you all are actually a pretty intimidating group to speak to. Um, I've been in an audience at a number of convocations over the years. I know how sharp you are. I know how passionate you are. I know how you're not afraid to use your voice, which is great. And honestly, that's a little bit scary to be on this side of the podium, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so please challenge me if I present something you don't agree with or you know of a, an updated data source, let me know. Um, I really do want this to be as interactive as possible. I wish we were all in one room and you could just shout out answers since we can't do that. We're really hoping to be able to use the chat feature 
So there'll be a couple of times throughout tonight that I'll, I'll pause and invite you to add comments to the chat box and we'll try to make it interactive that way. So with that, um, we'll go on to the next slide. And tonight I have a proposition for you. And that is that everyone deserves nourishing food, the fuel they need to thrive and succeed. Everyone, regardless of circumstances, deserves the food they need. And I believe your generation is the one that's gonna ensure that happens. So I wanna kick off tonight with a video and Kyle's got that queued up on the next slide. All right, everyone, we made it. My job is to help new homeowners who have turned into their parents. I'm having a big lunch and then just a snack for so dinner. So we're just... using a speakerphone in this store. Is that a good idea? One of the ways I do that is to get them out of the home. If you're looking for a grout brush. This Garth, is the... did he ask for your help? No. 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 We all see it. We all see it. He has blue hair. OK. Blue. Progressive can't protect you from becoming your parents, but we can protect your home and auto when you bundle with us. Keep it coming. You don't know him. Sorry for those of you who may have seen that commercial more times than you care to think about. Uh, but yes, this side part haired, skinny jeans wearing mom can say that is one of my favorite commercials ever. And I think it's just perfect for the pandemic. I don't know if you saw the tagline for Dr. Rick, but it's just because you have to be home doesn't mean you have to become your parents. Both of our kids who are your age for the audience um, had to move home in the pandemic and we made the best of it. Uh, but I just love that commercial just makes me laugh. And I have to say, it is kind of hard to be the butt of the joke and to realize your demographic is a target for marketers. It's not mine anymore. Um, I honestly thought that growing old would take longer than it did. I just want you to know, just wait. Before you know it, you'll be the one on the other side of these kind of, of jokes. But honestly, I mean it, though, when I say I really do believe that your generation is the one that's going to end hunger. Um, and you can see on this next slide, here's some evidence. 94% of Gen Zs believe that companies should address social and environmental issues. It's the highest of any generation surveyed. And clearly you have the ear of the major companies and their marketing dollars. So they are listening to you and that's gonna make significant changes, I think, in social and environmental issues. You wanna leave the planet and society better than plant, past generations have done. And you're my heroes. And again, I say, I believe you're gonna do it. Um, and the next slide talks about something else I'm really proud of all of you. 30% of Gen Zoomers are willing to take a 10 to 20% pay cut to work towards a mission you care about. That makes me especially happy because one of my hopes for this evening is that many of you will be motivated to join our sector, to join the fight against hunger. You will not get rich doing it, but it will be a very rewarding career. Um, it won't be easy. There's roadblocks and challenges to overcome, but I believe you are up to the task of ending hunger. So let's dive right in. So I'm going to start off right from the start with an apology for the jargon. Uh, food insecurity, I think, is a terrible term, but it's the USDA's official definition. It's how we measure this issue that we're talking about today. So food insecurity is a lack of access at all times to enough food for a healthy, active life. So food insecure households had difficulty at some point during the year providing enough food for all of the members of their household because they didn't have enough resources to do it. So it could look like a parent skipping dinner to be sure there's enough food for their children. It could look like a grandmother raising her grandchildren who's having to choose between paying for food and paying for medicine. So food insecurity is a household level economic and social condition of limited and uncertain access to food. It's not the same as hunger. And I will admit right from the start that nonprofits, we use those terms, inter we interchange those terms a lot, food insecurity and hunger. Hunger is the potential consequence of food insecurity, but hunger is really more of an individual level physiological condition that may result from food insecurity, or it may result from you didn't have time to eat dinner. Um, so even though we use hunger interchangeably, it's really food insecurity that we're talking about. Somebody in the household had to go without food because they didn't have the resources for it. And so the next slide, this is all pre-pandemic data, but just to give you a snapshot of food security in the US, 
For more than a decade, it was trending in the right direction, down, both for the overall population and for children. Um, 2019 levels, which is what is represented on this pie chart here, were substantially, significantly lower than pre-recession levels from 2007. So we were making progress. But even in that trend, the right trend when we were going down, you'll see on this pie chart, there were still one in 10 households that didn't always have enough food to eat. Um, I will mention from the outset that I'm using USDA's food insecurity definition. Um, it comes from the, the culture, the current population survey. That's the gold standard for measuring food insecurity. It's a large representative sample, rigorous screening process, includes a wide range of questions, but it's very time consuming because of all those benefits. It's very expensive and there's a, a delayed result. So for example, like I said, these data on the screen are the latest available. The December 2020 data that were just collected, they're not gonna be ready till September 21. So uh, we do have the Census Bureau's pulse surveys that have kind of given a, a more updated um, survey every two weeks, but the survey is much less rigorous and less robust, but it has confirmed what we know that food insecurity is, is increasing because of the pandemic. All right, so the next slide is our first chance for interaction. And I'm serious, I would love to see as many of you answering this question as possible. How good is the United States at keeping ourselves fed? What, what kind of job are we doing feeding ourselves? Go ahead and, and put your answers in the chat box. What do you think? Daniela, thank you, not so great, the poor overlooked. Marlene Michael said 30-70, 50-50. Thank you, Marlene. Any other thoughts? How are we doing? Brayden, thank you, the United States is not the best. Marlene, we have tons of food, it's just we're not distributing it. Caveman said 70-30. Janet, yes, we waste a ton of food. Too many people are going hungry, thank you, Hannah. Yes, yes, absolutely. So. The next slide will show, uh, and I'm sorry that it's it's ugly and messy. It's a visual representation though. Um, if this, this shows uh, based on a survey of many countries and if Kyle clicks on the next one, you can see a red arrow pointing to where the US is. Uh, that's what you'd call an outlier. Um, despite being the richest country in the survey, the percent of Americans who reported having trouble putting food on the table in the past 12 months was three times higher than Germany and more than twice as high as Italy and Canada. So we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is that? Why aren't we embarrassed by that? And why isn't our embarrassment spurring us to demand change? So I'm gonna jump right into another question. Go ahead and put right back in the, in the chat box. Picture, when you think of somebody struggling with, with hunger, what does the face look like? What face do you picture when you think of somebody struggling with hunger? Go ahead and put your answers in there. Thank you, Marlene. Grief and sadness. Hunger pains, heartbroken. How about any of the characteristics? What, what do you think? A, a dirty child, Janet might, yes, that's something we hear often. Cranky, poor. Sunken in, sad and dirty, hangry. Thanks, Marlene. Cameron says a thin face. Devin says tired. Thanks, guys. Fatigue. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the next slide, we'll start digging into some of the characteristics about who struggles with hunger in America. Um, so, Kyle, if you can go on to the next slide. We like to say in our sector, the face of hunger may surprise you. Um, we know that households in America are more likely to experience food insecurity if they include children and if they're headed by a single parent, especially if the household, if the single parent is female. Um, households, uh, hunger in households with children is up by almost two thirds. And these households are 70% more likely to not have enough food than households without children unacceptable. And we know that within families, adults really do their best to protect their kids from hunger by cutting their own food intake first. So 
it's all the more alarming when you think about the number of kids who are still not having enough food to eat despite the efforts that the other adults in their household are doing to try to make sure they get food. So the next slide just kind of digs in deeper to this. Child, and, child hunger was a crisis before the pandemic um, when one in seven kids in America didn't always have enough food to eat, but it has been made much worse by the pandemic. Now, these are estimates. We estimate that one in five kids in America now don't always have enough food to eat. We cannot claim to be the greatest nation in the world when we allow so many of our children to go hungry. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is actually from Jeff Bridges, who's the dude. Um, he is a celebrity spokesman for Share Our Strength. Jeff says, if another country were doing this to our children, we'd be at war. It's unacceptable. We cannot continue to allow this to happen. So the next slide uh, has a map of rates of child food insecurity. And the darker the county, the higher the rate of child food insecurity. Um, you'll, and again, these data are from 2019. That's the latest available. Feeding America it comes up with estimates by county. Um, but you can see, even before the pandemic, there was child food insecurity in every single county in the United States. There is not one county in the U.S. that does not have a child living in a food insecure household. Um, you can see clear patterns um, that it tends to be the highest in the South, followed by the Midwest. But clearly, from coast to coast, from border to border, we have a problem with food insecurity among children in our household. So the next slide will dig in deeper into Kentucky. Again, pre-pandemic, Kentucky's rates were higher than the national rate. One in five children in Kentucky before the pandemic struck did not have enough food to eat consistently. Um, and again, the estimates are, we won't know till September, but that we think that this has actually tripled for households with children. And so digging in even deeper, zoom in more. McGoffin County, Kentucky on the next slide, which had the highest rate of child food insecurity in Kentucky in 2019. More than one in three children already did not have enough food to eat. And that's before the pandemic struck. So clearly this is a crisis that we need to be dealing with. Uh, so the next slide, in addition to children, you are more likely to struggle from hunger if you are a member of a community of color. And so the next slide kind of shows a graphic demonstration of the racial disparities that continue to persist. The pandemic definitely has exacerbated long span standing uh, disparities. We know that inequity like hunger has disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minority groups. You'll see on this chart, every group has seen the rate of hunger more than double between 2018 and today. But during, you'll see the, the top line that the rate among households with black children are nearly twice as high as white children. And rates for Hispanic respondents are 60% higher than white children. Many, many, many people are suffering in, in America and, then, and around the world because of the pandemic. But clearly here in America, if you are a member of a community of color, your children are struggling more. We cannot continue to allow that to happen. The next slide talks about another face that may surprise you. Often when people think about who's struggling with hunger and why, we'll hear people say, oh, it's an inner city problem, it's an urban problem. Actually, no, it's a rural problem. Yes, food insecurity exists in urban areas and inner cities, but we know, um, if Kyle, if you could go to the next slide, that 90%, nearly 90% of the counties with the highest rates are rural. And I had Kyle put this map up, map up again for you visual learners to see the rural areas and how much darker they are than the urban areas. And then the next slide has that summary. 86% of the counties with the highest rates of child food insecurity are rural. And if it's okay, I'd like to stay on this point for just a little bit. Um, Rural communities have many strengths, as those of us who have chosen to live here know. Um, in fact, I was raised in a number of different urban areas as a child, and I made the conscious decision to move to rural areas as an adult, and in fact, have lived in rural communities in three different states here in the U.S. We have strong connections to where we live. Residents really say they appreciate the quiet and the relative safety, and it makes them a good place to raise children. 
in rural communities, we care for one another. There's strong social ties. We like being able to depend on friends and family. When something goes wrong, we have growing, thriving, locally owned businesses with entrepreneurial owners. We have stunning beauty, many abundant natural resources. We have a lot going for us in rural counties. But we also face some challenges that are unique to rural areas and barriers to accessing enough food to eat. Top of the mind for me is economic instability and lack of job opportunities, limited options to earn a living. And that's because industries like farming and mining and manufacturing and textiles, those were the bedrock of rural jobs for generations. But these jobs, as they become increasingly outsourced to other nations or automated, it's leaving people in small towns and rural counties with far fewer ways to earn a living. And in fact, we know uh, Dr. Jim Ziliak from UK, a, a local hero, he did a study that showed just a couple of years ago, half of the men who lack high school degrees in rural America were out of the labor force, half. And that's compared to just a generation ago, going back to generations. In 1967, 90% of those men had jobs. So just in one generation, it changed to where if you are a man who doesn't have a high school degree in rural America, chances are you don't have a job because there is no job available for you. Urban and suburban areas experienced recovery from the Great Recession of 2007 that didn't even reach rural areas. We, we never did see full recovery from the last recession before the pandemic recession struck. Um, the pandemic has made the job situation much worse. Uh, if you rely on service sectors, uh, McDonald's, uh, you know, a, a hotel for your job, those were that's what shut down in March, as we all know. Um, so it, it made people in rural communities really struggle even more. And as many in this audience, I know uh, because I've I've talked to many of you, young adults often feel the heartache of wanting an education and wanting better opportunities, but knowing that the reality is for many rural communities there are no decent job opportunities at home. So if you earn your education and have your horizons opened, you may have to leave behind your community and your family to be able to use your education. It's just, just a heartbreaking situation. And it's meant rural communities have lower tax bases, which meant we have a weaker and fragile infrastructure, unreliable transportation, no public transportation in many areas. So if you have a car that's broken down or you can't afford gas, you're out of luck. We're long distance away from grocery stores in many communities, especially grocery stores that offer affordable, nourishing food, and especially stores that will accept benefits like SNAP and WIC. And um, I'll get off my soapbox, but the last two challenges I really see in uh, rural areas, um, the emergency food system, which we'll talk about next, the food bank system, they will tell you they are not reaching every rural community and, and they, they do a great job of mapping out underserved communities and many of them are rural. Um, if you live in a rural community, you may only have access to a food bank one time a month and it may only be for a couple hours a day. If you happen to be working that one day a month or picking up your kids from school, you're out of luck. Um, many rural areas don't have SNAP enrollment offices or WIC enrollment offices, so rural community members can't avail themselves of the government programs that we'll talk about too. So it shouldn't be a surprise then to see the statistic up here that 86% of the counties with the highest rates are rural. Um, okay, next I'll, I'll wind up with this on um, the face of hunger that might surprise you. Another, uh, it should rock everybody's world who believes in American exceptionalism. You are much more likely to experience food insecurity in the US if there is a child or a parent in the household who's disabled, or if there's a member that's a veteran of a recent war. So once again, we are not living up to our own cultural expectations and bragging points, and it's simply unacceptable. Okay, so the next question, go ahead and put in the chat box. Why do you think it matters that kids have enough nourishing food to eat? Go ahead and pop that in there. Why does it matter? Why should we care that kids have enough nourishing food to eat? They can't focus on school. Thank you, Elliot Sandberg. That's my son. Thank you, Elliot, calling in from Nashville. Um, Devin, it helps with development. Cameron Brown, it helps them learn. Cademan, so they can grow and be healthy and capable human beings. 
Um, Lisa, it's a determining factor in learning and success. Absolutely, yes, you, you all have it. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, um, this is you, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, food insecurity is associated with poor health outcomes among kids. We know that the brain develops, 90% of the brain development happens in the first five years of age. What if that child doesn't have access to the food for that brain to develop? Um, young food insecure kids are more than twice as likely to have poor health. There uh, increases their chance of uh, chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart disease. It's tied to anemia, which negatively impacts motor skills and social skills, which leads to intellectual and, and emotional development impairment, poor performance in school, not college and career ready. You all know this. It, we need to care. They're, they're, it's unacceptable morally, and it's costing our nation, our future workforce. Um, and so the next slide I, I put in here just to drill down even deeper, because Save the Children, our goal, we want every child in rural America to be ready for kindergarten. We want every child in the third grade to be performing at grade level proficiency, both on reading and numeracy. But we know kids can't be hungry for knowledge if they're hungry for food. And so just, just like we've talked about, you have lower math scores, more likely to have that poor academic performance, more likely to repeat a grade, more likely to miss out on school. Um, we need our kids to be nourished and we need them to have full bellies and full minds. And so the next slide um, talks about, thankfully, there are solutions. There's organizations working to meet the immediate need for food assistance right here in the bluegrass area of Kentucky. Uh, God's Pantry Food Banks, there's 50 counties in central and eastern Kentucky in partnership with more than 400 food pantries and meal programs. People would be amazed. I don't think people understand the volume of food that regional food banks distribute. God's Pantry Food Bank distributed 41 million pounds of food in their last fiscal year. And almost 14 million pounds of that was fresh produce. So it's not just canned soup anymore. Um, and Berea Food Bank right there is a member of God's Pantry Food Bank. They have had an incredible year. In 2020, they served three times as many families as they did in 2019. They doubled the amount of food offered each client. Um, they balance their inventory to provide a week's meal for every family. They double the number of times families can access food every month. So there are champions right in your community working to meet the immediate need. And that picture on the bottom, of course, is a Kelts uh, food drive. Um, and we've, we've heard from Berea Food Bank that that has really made a, a huge difference um, in their efforts to serve their community. So the next slide also talks about, we also have, in addition to the charitable sector, we have a safety net in the United States that works. It's not perfect, there's holes in the safety net, but it has kept our children from having the distended bellies that you see um, from other nations. It really has worked to avoid some of the horrendous situations we see in other nations, like the SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, WIC, the summer food service program, the after school meals program. These programs work to help meet the need for food assistance. And we'll talk about it later, but policy matters. And um, the recently enacted American Rescue Plan includes $12 billion with a B to strengthen many of these programs here. It extends the SNAP benefit increase. Um, it, it helps more families meet their need for food assistance. It extended the pandemic EBT program that is helping families with school children who are missing out on school meals have a benefit card where they can use that to replace the meals they're not getting at school and invest in WIC to modernize the program. So, so uh, policy works. And the next slide talks about even more local solutions here in Berea. Um, Grow Appalachia, I think Kyle's trying to get it. I hope it's not stuck, but I'll keep talking. Uh, Grow Appalachia, top, the top left corner there, that picture is of Martina LaForce, one of my personal sheroes. Uh, Grow Appalachia helps people build their own food. That's Martina putting up a high tunnel. Berea Kids Eat, the next picture over, which Martina leads. 520,000 meals distributed by Berea Kids Eat just since March, 42 jobs created, $280,000 invested in Berea's food economy, $128,000 invested in farming, zero cases of COVID. Um, the next picture down is school gardens at Berea Community School. And that last picture with the little guy holding the cup is a Save the Children partnership with Appalachian Harvest that we're distributing hydroponic grow kits in partnership with App Harvest to help kids learn how to grow their own food. So the, the next topic is food waste. How much food do you think is wasted in the US? I'm running short of time, so pop your questions in really quickly. What would you guess? 
how much food do we waste in the U.S.? 40%, Hannah says lots. Michelle, thank you for your answer. <laughs> Nearly 50% says Randy McQueen, thank you for your answers. Janet Meyer, 50%. Okay, Kyle, can you go on to the next slide? Very good, you all are, I mean, 54 million food waste tons are wasted a year in America. It's ridiculous. Half of that is food that goes straight to the landfill. 26% is food that's never even harvested. It rots on the line. And so the next slide has a video that Kyle's gonna queue up for us to talk more about this. the family's food distribution. A large majority of our population in this county has food insecurities. I want to make sure that these kids and these families get fed well and have the energy to learn. probably the toughest year we've ever had and Save the Children has been there every step of the way helping us. I had to quit work because uh, I have to take care of my kids. Uh, they don't have a babysitter. Save the Children, they give us uh, stuff to help us through the month. We appreciate everything Save the Children does. Uh, it's been a big help to us and I'm sure everybody else appreciates it too. There was chicken sausages and chicken meatballs, and then there's vegetables. There's always onions, I think, and potatoes, apples, cheese, and butter. So, I mean, there's, there's basically everything you could need, really, for several meals. I work for our groceries. With him being at home, and he eats like a teenager, it helps out tremendous. I can take a day off and not have to worry about buying those essentials, because these boxes has all the essentials we need. My experience with Save the Children has been very rewarding. They show support for the community and the community knows that. When they see that big red sign, Save the Children, they know that there's either help there or there's help on the way. Thank you. And that's another example of policy working that Farmers to Families Food Boxes program came from USDA as a result of the CARES Act. USDA paid distributors and farmers for the food that they weren't able to sell to restaurants when everything shut down or schools and have been distributing it through nonprofits directly to families in need. So I know I'm coming up on my time, so I'll wind up just one other tech-based solution for food waste. Um, there's wonderful apps that are connecting uh, sources of food from like restaurants or grocery stores, prepared food that can't go to a shelf on a food pantry, connecting volunteers to go pick that up and take it straight to the communities that need it. So um, that's driven by your generation. These tech supports have been really great. And so I'll wind down with my last topic and we're, we're running out of time. So we'll take time just for a, a couple chat responses, but why, why do you think families are struggling to feed their kids in America? What's the, what's the root cause of this? No jobs from Hannah Collins. Thank you, Hannah. Income disparity. Thank you, Janet. Yep. Okay. And we'll go on then to the next slide. Uh, and we can, so I can wrap this up, Kyle. So yes, um, you all, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. You, you know, uh, you know this, this issue, but I wanted to bring up charity versus justice. And it's, it's a challenging thing for somebody who's worked in the charitable sector for my, literally my entire career. Charity responds to the immediate need, which is important. Justice responds to long-term needs. Charity requires repeated actions. You come to the food pantry, every time it's open, you get food. The food only lasts a couple of days, you need it again. Justice resolves structural issues. Charity is directed at the effects of injustice, but justice is directed at the root cause of that injustice. Charity feels great for the person giving the help, but you don't always see the results of your effort 
for, with justice work. And it, it is a long, long haul. Um, so, uh, but with the next slide, I'll, I'll wrap it up here talking about the additional drivers of food insecurity, which many, you, you know, I'm preaching the choir here, unemployment, income shocks. And it, I will say, if there is one silver lining of the pandemic, besides having my kids move home with me, which they probably didn't think was great, but I loved it. But another silver lining is that income shocks. We went, I believe it's changed the narrative in the U.S. from if you need help putting food on the table, it's because you're lazy to, oh my goodness, this could happen to me. I used to volunteer at the food bank and I'm the one in line needing help myself. So the pandemic has shown how common income shocks are. Fewer assets to buy food, higher living costs. We're, we're out of time, but racial discrimination in U.S. housing policies like real estate redlining, discriminatory bait and practices, homes in poor neighborhoods that are taxed at twice the rate of those in rich neighborhoods, all that drives food insecurity. And the next slide, I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but Save the Children tested a model where we actually gave cash to people who needed help putting food on the table. No strings attached. Didn't tell them how they had to spend it. Didn't make them participate in any program with amazing results. 80% drop in food insecurity. And you know what? The family spent the money wisely. If we trust people with money, instead of having a paternalistic attitude, they, they do the right thing for their, fam for their families. They want to do what's right. Um, so the next screen um, talks about my wish list. We would end child hunger if everybody could receive a high quality education needed to prepare for college and career. And then once you were ready for college and career, you had a job that actually paid a living wage and that was available for all of us. If all of us had the opportunity to build wealth through home ownership to help us weather those storms for the inevitable income shocks that we're gonna experience when the car breaks down or somebody's hospitalized or you're divorced, there are things we can do systemically to ensure that everyone has enough nourishing food, the fuel they need to thrive and succeed. And so I'll wrap up with a call to action for you all. Uh, as you saw in the, the video before we started, um, the Celts has another opportunity, even in the midst of a pandemic, for you to take action. Berea Food Bank uh, needs volunteers and food drives. Save the Children has a warehouse right there in Berea. We'd love to have your help there. Um, the next slide talks about donating. Food drives really do make a huge difference. The, the Berea Food Bank says your Celts food drive is one of their largest sources of food. If you have a garden, plant an extra row and donate the produce to your local food pantry or shelter. Money is another touchy subject in America, but honestly, food banks can do a lot more if you donate $1 and trust them to spend it wisely than if you spend a dollar at the grocery store and donate a, a, that can of food because of their purchasing power and their scalability. And then finally, of course, policy matters. Um, vote and advocate. It might be too small for you to see, but I put on there, uh, Save the Children has an action network, savethechildrenactionnetwork.org slash act. Go there right now. You can get connected immediately into taking action to change the systemic issues that we talked about tonight. And so I will end with a quote from Anne Frank. Hunger is not a problem. It's an obscenity. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. And again, I say, it's a tough challenge. We have a lot of issues to overcome, but I truly believe that your generation is going to end child hunger and I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much. Amazing, thank you so much, Tamara. Um, we have a question from a Celt student. Um, I know COVID has been a big contributor to the stimulus checks, but what happens when COVID is contained and things go mostly back to normal? Will a new program be created to help these families or will they just have to go back to how it was before? That's a great question and such an excellent point. And actually that's exactly what we're advocating for as wonderful as the many stimulus packages that have been en enacted and as much of a lifeline as it's been to so many people is temporary. And again, we know in rural areas the economic recovery is going to take much longer in rural areas than it will in urban areas. And the economic recovery is going to last much longer than the pandemic. When we're finally given the all clear to go back to our normal lives, it's going to take a long time for the economic recovery to come into place too. So you're asking exactly what we're 
we're going to Congress. In fact, I was at a policy conference today um, doing virtual visits saying, this is great and you've helped temporarily, but we need something that's gonna go beyond what this American Rescue Plan enables. Great question. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Randy McWayne in the comments. Um, what are your thoughts on having a law that makes it illegal for markets to throw food away and require them instead to donate it to food banks and charities? Um, so this is a, like a law they passed in France. I love that law. I would love to advocate for such a law here. It is amazing to see the impact that law has had in France. Uh, it, I, the, uh, the businesses don't like it, um, but it, it, I love it. I think that would really, really help. And, and I, I shouldn't disparage businesses because the truth is food banks do receive a lot of the food that they donate from businesses. Uh, grocery stores that are about to have post-dated meat will freeze them and wait for a food bank to come pick it up. And it's great. But the truth is the food banks are also helping the businesses bottom line because they would have had to spend money throwing that away anyway. So I, I think that's part of the reason that law has been so successful in France is it, it, it helps reduce, eliminate this, this problem of connecting the food we have with the people who need it. So if you get a sponsor for that bill, I will, I will do my best to get as many to sign on. I love it. Great, so still thinking about um, policy solutions. We have a question from Judith Wegman. Has Save the Children made a recommendation for an increase in the minimum wage? Oh, hey Judith, our friends, our boys played soccer together. This is so fun. I wish we were in person, but um, Save the Children has not taken a stand on uh, increasing the minimum wage. We, we have talked about it. It's, in, it's just an issue of, of scope creep with, with Save the Children. Um, so no, we, we haven't taken a stance on the minimum wage yet because there's so many other immediate um, policy priorities to focus on. But personally, yes, you, you know, I personally would love to, to see that enacted as well. Great question, Judith. Um, what current policy priorities does Save the Children have? Um, probably taking into consideration the impacts of COVID as well. Yeah, so our current priority um, for our food security sector work alone, and we, all, we also have priorities for Head Start funding and childcare funding, but my division, the food insecurity um, focus is on the child nutrition reauthorization, which we're way past due. It was supposed to have happened previously and it didn't. That funds all those nutrition programs that I mentioned that are so crucial to kids. So we're advocating for some of these waivers that have been enacted during the pandemic that Martina is using to distribute so many, so much food in, in Berea that allows families to come pick up the food instead of the child having to sit there in a congregate setting and eat it. That allows a family to pick up multiple days of food. We're advocating for that to be made permanent because in rural communities, we lived two miles away from the, the school. My kids easily could have walked if there had been a safe route or ridden their bikes. And they never did because there was no safe route in, in our little rural community. So we're definitely advocating for these wins we've seen during the pandemic to be enacted permanently for the pandemic EBT. We are advocating for a WIC modernization act. Um, the rates of uh, eligible people who are using WIC are just it's really sad how few people who are eligible are using it. And we think in rural areas, it's because there's too many of those barriers are mentioned, like not having easy access to enrollment office, having to go in person for some of these activities that are required, allowing folks to continue doing that um, electronically after the pandemic ends will continue to benefit rural communities. So um, that's another one of our good uh, main policy priorities. Amazing, thank you. Um, so our next question is, what does international hunger advocacy look like and how are the overlapping issues similar and different in rural and international communities? Such a good question. And honestly, that was why I was so excited to join Save the Children. I just started this job in September. Actually, they just created the position uh, for the first time in September. And it was as, as re a response to the pandemic because the frontline staff at Save the Children were seeing so many kids not able to focus on kindergarten readiness or third grade proficiency because they were hungry. So they created my position. And what appealed to me was the lessons that Save the Children has learned from our international work and the cash transfer project that I mentioned is a great example. Save the Children has been doing that with great success internationally and has been able to demonstrate with thorough research that yes, that does help reduce food insecurity. And so, 
it's just wonderful to be a part of an international organization that already has great lessons learned and great best practices that we can try here and then vice versa. We're soon to launch an innovation lab because there is no one proven best practice for ending rural child hunger in the US. What works in urban settings cannot be translated automatically to urban. And so we're going to host an innovation lab, sponsor a contest, hopefully connect the best ideas with sources of funding, and test out new ideas for um, addressing rural hunger. And then to the point, of, then we can share with other international countries what we've learned here. Great question. Excellent. Um, the next one is, are there specific urban responses to hunger that are similar or different from those in rural communities? Such a good question. Man, I, I knew I would enjoy speaking with you guys. And yes, honestly, in fact, I was on a call today where we were talking about the difference between urban and, and rural responses. And on the one hand, we know what works. SNAP works. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program works. It works. There's measurable decreases in food security. It helps the local economy because those benefits are spent locally, which helps the local retailers, the local farmers. SNAP works in urban settings. The difference in rural settings if you don't have access to a grocery store without driving an hour, or if the only grocery store you have doesn't accept SNAP benefits, that's not working. So it's, we know SNAP works. We just need to tweak it a little bit to and allow some flexibility. The, the pandemic EBT card that I mentioned is a great example. We would love to see that enacted permanently. And a summer EBT, or like my kids who couldn't get to a summer food service program site in the summer, give them an EBT card and then they can access the meals that way. Unlike in an urban setting where sponsors have a much easier time because one bus can hit 10 sites with 100 kids at each site and it's a much cheaper way to distribute the food. Our rural communities really struggle. The reimbursement rates do not cover their expenses when you have to drive the bus so far away and there's so many fewer kids. Um, that those are examples, they work in urban areas, but we need some tweaks to make them really um, benefit all kids in rural communities. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have another good question in the chat. Um, so what do you see as advantages of the wide net options? So like stimulus checks, tax credits versus narrow net options like SNAP or EBT. Um, and what do you think we will see moving forward? And then also, what do you think will be most effective? Great question. I love the fact that, well, I'm most excited about the uh, American recovery, the, the most recent stimulus package that includes that child tax credit program that we're pretty sure is going to cut child poverty in half. And I love the fact that it's it's um, the, the kind of program that many other low-income families would miss, miss out on tax credit benefits because if you don't earn enough to have taxable income, you miss out on the benefit. And what I love about the child tax credit is families are going to receive that benefit, even if they don't pay in as much as they get out from the benefit. I love the fact that families are going to receive these benefits regularly throughout the year if everything goes as planned instead of having to wait to the end of the year when they file their taxes. I I think that is just one of the best immediate solutions to child poverty, which again, poverty is the root cause of food insecurity in my mind. That is, if we can get that child, child tax credit enacted permanently, that's when we're really gonna start truly moving the needle on child hunger. Great, um, so now what are your thoughts on the nutrition side of food and hunger? Um, so, for example, limiting the amount of processed food we're giving to our children, calorie count requirements, or thinking about what kinds of foods we subsidize. I'm so glad this question came up because uh, I wanted to include it in my presentation and I struggled to keep it on, the, on time as it is. That gets to exactly one of these issues, these, this paradox we have between hunger and obesity or food insecurity and obesity. Um, that uh, when you live in a community that your only source of groceries is the gas station or the dollar store, and the dollar stores are trying to add more fresh produce. But if, if, that, if the only food you can access has low nutrients, but high calories, and you're spending a lot of money buying it, of course, you're gonna have both food insecurity and obesity. Now, this is a, a controversial topic in, in the charitable sector. Um, you know, there, 
Feeding America is the food bank network and they, they, their members accept pretty much anything. Um, and I'm not a member of their network anymore. So I'm trusting somebody to correct me if it's changed since I was, but they'll, they'll, they'll take sheet cakes. They'll take pop in many cases, any kind of food um, that goes out. And the theory is the justification is food is food and these people need it. And all, all of us Americans, you know, many of us drink pop and have sheet cakes. So you should have that too. Um, but I personally, say the children doesn't have a stand on this, but I personally would love to see us using the federal benefits, the SNAP program, the, the SFSPs, summer school meals, after school meals. I would love to see them focus on both food insecurity and what our new, again, um, Ag Secretary Vilsack calls nutrition insecurity, that that we, sh we could use those resources to encourage even more nourishing food because we know that people's tastes change. Uh, my kids were at the school when Michelle Obama and the Healthy Free, uh, School Lunch Act and you know the memes about thanks Michelle and they'd show the pictures of the food they didn't like. But we, we were able to see over time their, their taste did change, that it is possible to change people's um, food preferences. So in short, I absolutely believe personally, I would love to see more of a focus on nutrient rich food distributed to people struggling from food insecurity. Excellent, thank you. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, next question is, what about the individuals who don't have children but still struggle with hunger? So like single working or unemployed individuals, college students, um, it seems like they don't have nearly as many options available to them as families with children. Yes, and especially if you're, the acronym is an able-bodied adult without dependents or ABOD, yeah, Lord help you if you were struggling in, to put food on the table during the last administration because they did many, many things to make it almost impossible for able-bodied adults without dependents to get food assistance. Thankfully, that's, that's changed recently. But yeah, there, there absolutely is a, a bias against um, people who don't have children that need food. It, it's Frankly, it's much easier to raise funds and resources to feed hungry kids there's a bias against a 50 year old man who needs help putting food on the table. And in fact, according to the most recent research, Kentucky had the highest rate in the nation of older adults 50 to 59 who didn't always have enough food to eat. Um, so it's SNAP benefits are not enough. And if that's pretty much the only thing you can access as a college student or an adult without dependents, and even that is severely limited if you don't meet the work requirements or um, and the S in SNAP stands for supplemental. It was never supposed to be in everything as it is. And we know most SNAP benefits run out within two weeks. It's, it's a huge problem for older adults and senior citizens um, that we're really hoping the administration um, continues to take that issue on as well. Thank you. Um... Next question is, how can we combat common or misguided stereotypes associated with hunger and people who are hungry, especially in the policy arena? I love that question. You changing, the, changing the stereotypes and the myths about who's hungry and why. And when I was with Feeding Kentucky for the previous decade, I'd spent a lot of time meeting in Frankfurt with legislators. And I cannot tell you the number of times I would go in to speak about child hunger and, and somebody would say, well, my brother's uncle's cousin sells his food stamps for drugs and that these people are just lazy and so trying to get through the anecdotes do not equal data and for every anecdote you can share about somebody cheating the system I can share 20 about you know a, a poor a mother a single mom who's doing her best and struggling she's working two part-time jobs and still struggling to put food on the table so changing I what we have tried to do is bring impacted individuals with us to speak to legislators and elected officials. Um, we did that at Feeding Kentucky when we'd have our hunger-free Kentucky Day at the state capitol. Knowing, however, that they're, that's not always realistic. And if, if I'm a mom struggling to keep food on the, my table, I am likely, I don't have time or energy to get over to Frankfurt and take a day off of work and find childcare for my kids. So while we know that that is a great way to start changing, to let elected officials hear directly from their struggling constituents, it's not always easy to get them there. Um, so sharing stories through these, the video, like I showed, uh, we're, we're leashing that far and wide um, as we work with legislators to try to improve that federal farms to families food box program. Sharing their stories is important. And then 
I think it's also encouraging people just to be honest about struggles and how many of us have struggled and um, just almost changing the cultural expectations that if you struggle from hunger, you're not alone in this country in particular. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this, we're about out of time. So I'll finish up with this final question from someone in the chat. Um, what brought you to this work? Um, did you experience food insecurity personally? Such a good question. And I, Katie, I want to leave time for you too. We haven't let you say anything. So I think we should end with you answering that question too. But um, I, no, I did not experience food insecurity. I've lived in a life of an immense privilege, um, had everything handed to me I could ever want. Um, and have a twin brother who struggled with food insecurity related to his issues with substance abuse related to his, I'm convinced, issues with struggling with undiagnosed learning disabilities, which my parents tried so hard to get him the help he needed, but in the 70s, he just didn't get it. So I, I was drawn, even in high school, our church had a soup pantry, a soup kitchen, and I volunteered, and I remember I was sitting down to eat because we were allowed to eat. And somebody said, you're, you're not a client, you're a helper, aren't you? And I said, yeah, how can you tell just by looking at me? And that struck me that they could tell. But then my, my brother's struggles solidified it all the more, but I just was drawn to, it's just not right. It just makes me angry that any kid in this country that likes to think of ourselves as the richest country in the world, that any kid would go without hunger. It just makes me furious and angry and I wanna do something about it. And that's what drew me to the sector. How about you, Katie? Awesome, thank you. Um, I would say, so my first reaction would, just say, would be to say, no, I didn't really experience food insecurity as a kid. But I think a large part of that was because we, even though it was all around us and we were even experiencing at times, there's so much stigma around, you know, needing to like apply for assistance or that kind of thing. But at the same time, um, so many individuals experience it and just aren't very vocal about what they're experiencing. And that was my experience growing up. Um, but even then I was still surrounded with like all of these like grassroots efforts to try to combat hunger locally. Cause I grew up in Western North Carolina in a rural community and then moved to Berea, Kentucky for my undergrad. Um, and I also worked with the summer food service program now known as Berea Kids Eat for its first two summers of operation. Um, so I would say that that experience helping build that program is what pushed me into the role I have now. Um, and one of my favorite things about that program was that at least in the first two years, anyone could come and get a meal. Um, we weren't checking IDs for age requirements. We weren't checking income requirements. Just anyone who, who wanted a meal could come and get it. And that was one of my favorite aspects because, you know, I really think that it contributed to like um, like the societal and cultural changes that you briefly mentioned of, you know, like changing the stigma and just like, you know, like challenging the, you know, we want to believe that America is exceptional and great, but we also still have to grapple with the realities that we face in our own communities. Um, so I would say all of this kind of contributed to me thinking that, you know, I want to go into food justice work because there's a lot to be done. Um, and you have to think about the short-term solutions while also considering the, the larger goals that we should have as a society, you know, to make it, to make a more equitable food system. Um, so I really, I really appreciate the opportunity to hear from you today and hear more about what Save the Children is doing. Um, and we had some great questions. Katie? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ahrens, if that's... Um, all of the questions for tonight. Thank you. So this is Thomas Aaron's uh, convocations. And uh, I want to first thank everyone for these amazing comments and questions. And uh, that, was, that was just great. And of course, I'm very, very thankful to our uh, participants tonight. And uh, so our presenter, Tamrek Sandberg, thank you so much for all your insights and all the stuff that you shared to Elvia Rojas and uh, Katie McElrath. Uh, great job. Uh, wow, that was just amazing. And of course, <clears throat> our Kels colleagues, Ashley Cochran and Sarah Aurora, who were in the background, 
fielding some of the questions. And finally, uh, our uh, Zoom guru, <laughs> our AV engineer, Kyle Wooten, who did his very best to make this all look so easy and so great. I'm very thankful to all of you. And uh, yeah, so what's next? Just a quick look ahead. Uh, we'll have a Stevenson concert uh, uh, planned for April the 8th. Um, and this will be virtual and we'll be joined by the singer songwriter Carrie Newcomer, who will uh, join us live from Bloomington, Indiana. And this is a rescheduled concert. A year ago, we had to unfortunately pull the plug on this concert in, in uh, Phelps Stokes. So this will be virtual, uh, uh, very good nonetheless. So um, that wraps it up for tonight. Thank you again, everyone, and uh, be safe, and we'll see you again. Take care. Bye, everyone.